You're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. Welcome to episode one of a season two of The Buzz. You may have heard that this season we're going to be taking the big questions in science and engineering and finding out if we can find out the answers. In episode one, we're going to be talking to Dr. Eamon Kerens to find out if he knows if aliens exist. My name's Corey, and with my co-host Joe, we've come up with some interesting alien facts. So over to you, Joe. Thanks, Corey. Um, so I might be playing a bit fast and loose with the word facts here. Um, what I've got is, is more of a theory. And to be honest, I think it's one that's it's surely it's not true. But, you know, who knows with these things? So I'm going to be looking at Kant and perfectly proportional intelligence. So Immanuel Kant was a German philosopher and enlightenment thinker from the 1700s. Not only did he believe that aliens exist, but he believed that their intelligence was perfectly proportionate to their distance from the sun. For instance, aliens from Mercury or Neptune, the planets closest to the sun, they would be less refined, they'd be less rational than those aliens on planets further away from the sun, uh, Saturn, for instance. So with the Earth being the third planet from the sun, judging by this theory, it kind of suggests that we Earthlings are we're a bit kind of mediocre in comparison to <laughs> beings from other planets. Um, now, I don't know if that sounds good or bad. I think in one, from one angle, you can think, oh, that's quite, uh, quite scary. <laughs> there's, there's aliens out there that are a lot more intelligent than us. Or it could be a bit, you know, Fascinating the fact that there could be these aliens that could come and uh, tell us things that we would uh, we we could never dream of. But so sure of alien life was Kant that he wrote, "If it were possible to settle by any sort of experience whether there are any inhabitants of at least some of the planets that we see, I might well bet everything that I have on it." And for my second, I say fact again. I'm not too sure <laughs> if it's a fact, but. Uh, I'm going to go from one great mind to another, and I'm going to be talking about the one and only Will Smith. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so UFO sightings arguably date back as far as uh, 1440 BC and ancient Egypt, uh, although there is a lot of controversy and debate about this. Uh, but what we do know is that UFO sightings continue to be reported to this day. And what I found interesting in my research is that the number of these sightings seem to go up at times when aliens are more prominent in uh, popular culture, so in films, that kind of thing. Uh, and a good example of this is what's been called the Will Smith effect. Um, so in 1995, there were 117 reported UFO sightings in Britain. And the next year, in 1996, Independence Day came out, obviously starring Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum. And the number of sightings in that year shot up to 609, so wow. a huge leap. The following year, in 1997, uh, Will Smith appeared again in Men in Black, and that year there were 425 sightings in Britain. The following year, Will Smith wasn't in any sci-fi films, and the number dropped back down to 193. So wow. take from that what you will, Smith. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for those interesting theories, Joe. Uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have a couple of interesting theories as well that I, I came across. Great. Uh, the first is uh, a theory called panspermia. That's the idea, Joe, that you're actually an alien, that all life on Earth actually came from a different planet. Uh, so one of the big, uh, big questions in biology is about where did life come from? Did it start on Earth and evolve, or did it come from somewhere else? And one of the theories is that uh, a meteor or a comet came to Earth, crashed into Earth, and it deposited uh, forms of life on Earth, and therefore all life on Earth came from outer space. Um, it's quite a popular theory. Wow. I don't know if it's the prominent theory, but it's certainly uh, some credible scientists do hold that one, so maybe it has a bit more truth to the, to the uh, Kant theory. <laughs> uh, and then the second theory, again from the world of biology, um, is the idea that aliens might be writing uh, messages in our DNA. So one of the, uh, which we might even talk about in the episode, is the idea that aliens might send us messages. Mm. And one of the ways in which they can send us messages is in something that would be uh, 
something that we could read and we can actually read each other's DNA. And in our DNA sequence, there are millions and millions of base pairs that actually do nothing. They're not coding for anything, so they don't design proteins or don't build tissues or organs. And so um, one theory is that actually all that redundant DNA is because aliens have planted that in us so that they can send us messages. The only kind of caveat to that is there's only four base pairs. So either the alien language is very simplified and isn't as complex as our 26 layers, or we're just not very good at reading DNA. Right. Um, so who knows? Maybe they've already visited us and uh, put stuff in us. Right, put stuff in Will Smith. Well, possibly. <laughs> Someone who might be a bit more qualified to talk about these alien theories is Dr. Eamon Kerens. And here's our interview with him. So today we're joined by Dr. Eamon Karens, who's going to be talking to us about alien life. Um, so I thought I'd start off by asking, uh, have we actually found any alien life so far, Eamon? Um, if not, um, it might be quite a short uh, episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, sadly, we haven't yet found, con- found any confirmed alien life, but uh, uh, there have been some exciting recent results, actually, uh, and indeed results in the, in the past decade or so uh, that, are, that are connected. Certainly, for, uh, for instance, what we do know is that most planets host star, uh, most stars, sorry, host planets, um, and uh, a significant number of them are, are Earth-sized planets, and we know of a number of those that, in principle, could host life. They're at about the right temperature, let's say, to host life. Um, so everything we know so far about planets out there tells us that there's plenty of opportunities for life to be found, uh, but we're still in the process of, of finding out whether there is actually life around any of them. Sure. And so what are we looking for when we're looking for alien life? So there are two kinds of life that you might think to look for, or two kinds of signals. One might be uh, signals that that indicate uh, simple life, let's say bacterial life, uh, and that may well be the most common type of life out there to find. And then we might think to look for signals that suggest uh, highly intelligent life, technological life, life that, that we recognize as being technological. Uh, and so the, the way that of searching for those might be different in either case. But for simple life, for bacterial life, we, we could actually look for, try to look for evidence of that within our own solar system, either, either present day evidence or evidence that there might have been such life in the past. And that's certainly uh, an area of, of significant activity, uh, most recently uh, with the possibility of life uh, or, or at least a, a potential biomarker signature in the atmosphere of Venus. But there's been for some time interest in looking for uh, past life uh, on Mars. Uh, we know now that there's water on the moon, things like that. So there's, there's plenty of, of potential for finding life in our solar system, even in places we might not naively expect it around Saturn or Jupiter's moons, for instance, there's evidence uh, emerging there that some of those have large subsurface oceans of water, so that, that, that there could be uh, sort of subterranean life uh, potentially on, on some of those moons. Um, so that's there's a lot of activity there looking potentially for simpler forms of life. Uh, for more, more advanced forms of life, firstly, we have to recognize that we're a little bit biased in that, that we have to be able to recognize intelligent uh, signals of intelligent civilizations. And, and inevitably, there's, it's going to be uh, biased by our own views of, of technology and our own views of, 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 of uh, how we recognize that technology. But even within that bias, if we find nothing, I think that's you know as profound as finding something really. So, in terms of looking for intelligent life, we can uh, probe the atmospheres, or very soon we'll be able to probe the atmospheres of other planets to look for pollutants. You know the kind of pollutants that we dump in our atmosphere, um, and then uh, a little bit further in the future, though probably not too far away, uh, we might be able to look for evidence of, of nighttime lights. You know our, our planet. We light up our planet at, at, at night you know, around cities. The streetlights, et cetera, are pretty substantial sources of emission. We can look for heat emission from rockets, potentially, um, or even um, optical emission from laser signals that might be sent to us, or 
uh, radio emission, deliberate signals sent, sent by by radio transmission, and so those those sorts of, uh, of signals are the focus for for SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which are, which is a you know there are ongoing surveys looking for those kinds of emissions. You're talking about kind of getting atmospheric readings from different planets is that in our solar system or is that kind of in solar systems in nearby galaxies or so we're now doing this kind of work uh towards planets around other stars so-called exoplanets um so uh, as i mentioned we know that pretty much all stars host planets and for the larger ones at least uh, we are able to probe their, uh, their atmosphere. So I work with um, some students of mine on a, on a program that is doing just that, a program called SpearNet. And we use a technique called transmission spectroscopy. So some planets orbit their star at just the right angle that on every orbit, we'll see them pass in front, directly in front of their, their host star. Now we can't see you know, it's not like a you know a solar eclipse where we see the disk of the moon passing in front of the sun what we do see instead is just the, the host star dipping down temporarily in brightness as, as a small part of it is blocked by by this planet and that will happen once every every time that planet orbits so we see a small dip um, and the majority of that dip is because of the let's say the surface of that planet blocking out the light but the atmosphere, the, if there's a, a thin atmosphere around the planet, that might also block the light at certain wavelengths, but not block it at others. So, you know, the atmosphere might be quite transparent towards the redder end of the, of the optical spectrum, and it might be more opaque towards the bluer end. We know that's true of our own planet Earth. That's why the sky is blue. The sun's blue light is scattered by the atmosphere, um, whereas the red light is, is you know, passes pretty unhindered through our atmosphere. So we can look for evidence of, of uh, dips in starlight that might be stronger at some wavelengths and weaker at others. And from that, what we build up really is a, is a, a spectrum of the planet's atmosphere, how, how opaque it is as a, as a function of wavelength. And it turns out that if you do that with our own atmosphere, you can see chemical traces like methane and oxygen and so forth. They, they have quite a complex signature in the way in which they block light as a function of wavelength. So we can use that same technique, really, to, pr to look for the presence of water vapor or, or uh, ozone, et cetera, in, in other planets. Now, at the moment, we're only really able to look for uh, some chemicals in, in larger planets, in sort of Jupiter and Neptune-sized planets. But as our, our, as our technology improves, I think over the next decade or so, we're going to be starting to do that with Earth-sized planets too. These uh, techniques sound fascinating. Are these quite new techniques? Have they been around for a while, or is this something we're just beginning to explore now? They're, they're relatively new. In fact, in fact, the, the whole field of looking for for exoplanets, planets around other stars, is is itself pretty new. The, the first uh, detection of, of planets around other stars uh, came in the in the early to mid. 1990. Certainly, the first discovery of, let's say, a planet around an ordinary star came in 1995, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was a planet called 51 Peg B. We tend to give them very very dull. <laughs> <Can't we? laughs> it's not Vulcan or something like that. So, um, and and that came because uh, the the astronomers involved, uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Kello, they they noticed uh, that the the host star was was moving back and forwards along the line of sight. They, they used a, uh, um, an effect called the Doppler effect to, to notice that the star was moving back and forwards along the line of sight. And it was moving in the same way that a, a hammer thrower at the Olympics will rotate around his or her center of mass when they launch a hammer. Basically, both the hammer thrower and the hammer are co-orbiting around their common center of mass. And, and planetary systems do exactly the same thing. So our own star, our own star, the sun, doesn't just sit at the center of our solar system doing nothing. It actually orbits around the common center of mass of our solar system. And give or take, the common center of mass of our solar system, you can forget about all the other planets apart from Jupiter. That, that, that's the sort of heavyweight planets in our solar system. And the center of mass 
of our solar system is determined by the relative mass and distances of the Sun and Jupiter. So it turns out that um, the central mass of our solar system is a point which is about one thousandth of the distance between the Sun and Jupiter, because the Sun is a thousand times more massive than, than Jupiter is. And that distance pretty much places the central mass, at the, it happens to place it about the surface of the sun. So the central mass of the solar system is a point roughly on the surface of the sun. And so the sun pivots around its surface, give or take a few extra wobbles because of the other planets, uh, once every 11 years. So we have technology to detect that kind of motion. In fact, we can detect motions as small as uh, maybe 10 centimeters per second. So imagine a star, something that is where well, our sun is, is 700,000 kilometers in radius, so 100 times the radius of the Earth. And we can measure the motion of stars like the sun down to a precision of, of getting on for 10 centimeters per second. And that's about, it turns out, that's about the, the motion on the sun induced by the Earth. Okay, so the Earth makes the sun, if you were to remove all the other planets and just have the Earth and the sun, the sun would rotate about a, a, the common center of mass with a speed of about 10 centimeters per second. So we, we have those kind of methods now to, to detect planets, quite, quite potentially quite low mass planets. And there are a number of other techniques as well that, that they use. But that, that particular technique was to, used to, to find 51 Peg B, which is a bloating, big, hot Jupiter type planet. And it, it won, uh, quite rightly, won, won Didier Kello and uh, Michel Mayor the, the Nobel Prize uh, in 2019. Wow, that's crazy! Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, um, it seems like we've come a long way from uh, Jodie Foster and and what was the film she was in? Contact was it? <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's great. So, um, well, yes and no, I suppose. I mean, we do know that there are lots of planets. We've detected well over four thousand confirmed planets, but uh, in terms of contacting civilizations, it's still you know it's still really really early days for us. Um, so I think I I. I heard of an analogy uh, a short while ago that we've, in terms of the parameter space, we have to search to find whether there is or isn't intelligent life out there. We've we've kind of searched a, a bathtub full of the of the world's oceans. Uh, wow. So you know, there's there's still a huge amount of parameter space to cover. But I'm I'm quite optimistic about it actually, just because of how far we've come in such a, a short time. I mean. You know, there have been radio telescopes that have been looking out for signals for, for quite a while, for quite a number of decades, but it's only really recently, uh, and in particular with an initiative which uh, the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics is involved with, my, my colleague Mike Garrett is, is heavily involved with, called the Breakthrough Listen Initiative. So this is... Um, this is a, an effort which has been bankrolled to the tune of about $100 million by a Russian philanthropist, Yuri Milner. And it's a 10-year effort to use some of the world's largest uh, radio telescopes, including the telescopes at Jodrell Bank, to try and look for uh, radio signals uh, from um, a large area of sky. And, um, you know, they're... they're they're looking, the technology we've got now, they're able to look at something like 10 times more sky than previous surveys. They're looking at five times more of the radio spectrum, and they're searching it 100 times faster than previous surveys. So that's a massive leap forward in, in capability. And I think uh, they, they've got the, detect the, the capability, at least, of detecting aircraft radar from the nearest 1,000 stars. So that's, that's quite impressive. Um, now, it's still very much a needle in a haystack. In fact, that, that, that might be over-egging it. You know, it, this, there's hundreds of millions of stars in our galaxy, and we don't know how rare life may be, or it's certainly intelligent life, life that we would recognize as being intelligent. We don't know how rare that is, and we don't know what fraction of that is around whilst we're around, and we don't know what fraction of that is minded to, to send signals that we might be capable of detecting. So uh, the odds might be long, 
we, we don't really know. But mm-hmm. what we do know is that the technology we need and the, the, the methods we employ to, to try and look for this uh, are, are, are incredible. You know, it's, it's such a big data science challenge in terms of the volume of data you generate and how you search it using really smart algorithms. So I think the legacy of this kind of search, even if it doesn't find anything convincing as regards alien life, I think the legacy might be that, that, that there are some pretty smart technologies and methods produced, which will have utility in, in other areas, which is how science often progresses. You know, the World Wide Web uh, came out of, uh, you know, a particle physicist wanting the computers he worked with to, to communicate more transparently with each other. So so the law of unintended consequences is, is a very important ingredient in, in scientific and technological progress. And actually, um, even without detecting, necessarily detecting signals from life. I think that these teams are already finding some really interesting astrophysical signals that's helping to advance our knowledge about different types of phenomena in, in the universe. Um, with, with this kind of rapid rate of technological progress, would you say there's any chance of us perhaps finding aliens within our lifetime or within the lifetimes of people who will be listening to this podcast? So I'm, I'm kind of optimistic in the sense um, that we will find evidence either of past or present, perhaps simple life in our solar system, or um, in, in, as regards intelligent life, I think we will, we will either find out that there is evidence for intelligent life, or we will be able to demonstrate that life like us is incredibly rare. And when you think about it, I mean, Arthur C. Clarke uh, famously said that either there's life out there or there isn't, and either possibility is equally terrifying. And I, I think that's, that's, that's quite, a, quite a good statement. In fact, I, I would say that if we found that life is, out there is either absent or, or, or incredibly rare, to me that's almost more terrifying than finding mm. out there is life out there because mm. there is nothing in the laws of physics as we understand it that rules out the possibility of life out there. And, and as I say, we now know there are plenty of planets out there that, that uh, everything we know about them says they can potentially support life. So everything, the more we've pushed the frontiers of knowledge – the more the odds are tipping in favor of there being life out there. If we, if, if we were to conduct these surveys and, and their sensitivity were to grow and grow and grow to the extent that we could show that life elsewhere in the galaxy is essentially absent or largely absent, I, you know, that'd be incredibly profound, I think. It would really, uh, uh, certainly, I, it, I think it would cause us, I hope, to reflect upon the preciousness of, of life here on Earth. Yeah. That's the the Fermi paradox, isn't it? That we have so many stars, so many potential Earth-like planets, and yet seemingly so far there's no intelligent life, and I guess there must be a reason for that, perhaps. Yeah, so, so the Fermi paradox named after the, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist Enrico Fermi, and actually he was having a, a conversation one lunchtime in the 1950s uh, with colleagues when he sort of blurted out, where are they? And, uh, you know, I think it, probably his colleagues were, were a bit startled by that. But, but <laughs> what he meant was, was uh, where is the evidence that there is alien life? Now, back then in the 1950s, we had no, no idea, firm idea, whether or not there were planets around other stars. We had no scientific evidence yet for it. But what he was saying is that it's kind of surprising, in fact, that there's no evidence surrounding us of alien life, for instance, evidence of, of spacecraft or anything like that. And at first you think, well, that sounds pretty, you know, uh, outrageous. Why, why are you surprised by that? But if you think of our own technology, um, so by the early 1960s, we were sending people in space. We're, we're now sending probes out to, you know, that have probed the solar system. Um, and... Uh, there's, there's a project ongoing right now, also bankrolled by Yuri Milner, called Breakthrough Starshots. And they've got a, a pretty serious team of engineers to, that, that are planning to develop a small postage stamp sort of gram mass um, satellite 
that they can propel. They'll basically tie it to a, a, a kind of like a solar sail, and they'll fire lasers, high-powered lasers at this solar sail for about 10 minutes or so, which will accelerate this tiny spacecraft up to 20% of the speed of light. And they'll probably do this for many hundreds, if not thousands of these, and push them out towards uh, one of the nearest Earth-sized exoplanets that we know about, which is Proxima Centauri b. It orbits the, the very nearest star to the sun. And their aim is to, to send these things within a generation, within a time scale of 20 years, to the nearest star and, and, and maybe take flyby pictures of, 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 uh, of, of Proxima Centauri b. And so they think it will, they could do that. They can actually start launching these within about 30 years. The technology isn't fully there yet, but they are, they're, they're confident that they can actually develop the technology for near light speed interstellar tiny space probes. Um, so within 50, 60 years, if, if they're right, within 50, 60 years, we could have uh, pictures beamed back of, of Proxima Centauri b. We, and my point is we will then have achieved interstellar travel, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll have achieved that within a very short time scale of having achieved the capability of going into space at all. And then you would think, well, what will we achieve 100 years beyond that mm. and it's it's not a huge stretch of the imagination to believe that we could send space probes out say to the nearest star system that would search out asteroids mine copies of themselves and send maybe 10 of those out to the next nearest stars to do the same and so you've got this sort of virus growth of space probes that, that, that are you know going that every generation of them will search out 10 more a factor 10 more stars than the previous generation and even if they travel they don't even have to travel at 20 percent the speed of light even if they only travel the kinds of speeds that our current space probes uh, are, are reaching you know tens of thousands of miles per hour that sort of virulent type spread of space probes would end up colonizing the entire galaxy uh, within a million years. And, and a million years, of course, is, is a huge length of time for you and I, but it's a blink of an eye in, mm. the, in, the, in, in the galaxy's lifetime. The galaxy, even the sun has been around 5 billion years, our galaxy has been around for at least 10 billion years. So... When you look at it, when you compare those two timescales, you understand Fermi's point. It's astonishing that someone else hasn't beaten us to it, that if intelligent life isn't all that rare, that that hasn't been, that we haven't seen all these tiny or even not so tiny space probes whizzing past us. And when we, when we look at pristine surfaces like the moon or Mars, uh, and we, we, you know, we've mapped those those surfaces down to almost meter level scale. You know, uh, it, it, we see nothing at all other than our own space probes. We can image our own landers on those surfaces, but we don't see any other evidence of any other kind of lander at all from from anywhere else. So they seem totally pristine, totally untouched. And so Fermi's paradox, you know, fifty well, what are we seventy years on, is even more pronounced i think than, than it was when when fermi first considered it that the where are the where are they question is is you know we're, we're on the threshold of of being an example of the kind of civilization fermi was talking about and yet we see no evidence of such civilizations um having visited us so it causes some to think maybe we're alone or or um or that maybe we're not alone but that life is intelligent life is sufficiently rare that we're kind of ships in the night and we don't see each other so say for example if we did find aliens or aliens arrived here on earth what would be the the next steps do you think it would be a could it be a good thing or potentially a bad thing for the human race uh, well, yeah, so if, if they literally landed here, <laughs> the, the, next, the next steps probably wouldn't be in our hands, I suspect. Um, I mean, f first of all, uh, you know, we need a, a sense of perspective, I think, which is, uh, is how big the even our own galaxy is, the distances that are involved, right? So, um, so if we think of the scale of our solar system, uh, and we think of we think of distances in terms of the the amount of time it takes light to travel. So, 
light can travel a distance equal to seven times the circumference of Earth in, in, uh, in a second. Okay, so it takes about three quarters of a second for light to, or a, a signal traveling at the speed of light to reach the moon. Now, nothing, Einstein tells us nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. It's impossible to carry information at a speed faster than light. So that's, that's a, if Einstein is right, and our tests so far suggest that the relativity is, is as good a theory as, that, as exists in science, then that's a fundamental time limit that we can't overcome. Okay, So it's three quarters of a second to send a signal to the moon. It's eight minutes to receive a, a signal from the sun. Okay, Photons arriving at us from the sun have taken eight minutes to cross space. Um, even more remarkably, they've taken about several hundred thousand years from their point of formation in the center of the sun to reach the surface, but that's another issue. They take eight minutes to, to get from the surface to us. The nearest star, to, to the sun, Proxima Centauri, is four light years away. And as that distance suggests, it takes light four years to get from the nearest star to us. Um, the center of our galaxy is about 25,000 light years away. Okay, so you get a picture that actually, uh, you know, uh, space tourism, interstellar space tourism is not a trivial undertaking. You know, if, if there is a, a sort of galactic empire out there that wants to come and, and assert its dominance over us, they, they, they're going to have to have technology that's way, way above our technology. Mm. And sometimes we, 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 you know, there are fears raised about us sending signals out into space because of the possibility of such technologies. And I, I think... You know, whether or not we send signals out to space, it should be something that isn't just scientists, up to scientists to decide. But it's a fact that we are leaking all sorts of signals out into space. Over the past hundred years, there was all sorts of radio signal transmissions. Um, pollution in our atmosphere would be very easy to detect. Uh, our night side lights are very easy to detect. But all sorts of, you know, if there are civilizations out there with the power to come and visit us, uh, they will already know about us, I'm pretty sure about that, whether or not we send signals out there. So the fact that they haven't yet visited us suggests to me that, that you know, at least civilizations with that capability are probably very rare indeed. Um, yeah. So as, as to what we do, I think, I, th I think the most likely scenario is, is what would we do in the event that we detect a signal that suggests intelligence intelligent life rather than one coming to visit us i think that you know it's up to them what happens then rather than up to us but but as far as receiving a signal is concerned if we were convinced the first thing would be to try and confirm that signal make sure it wasn't just some sort of contamination in in one telescope but if it was confirmed and it was repetitive um, then I think there would have to be a, a sort of international discussion, political, um, uh, and, and also you know involving you know everyone basically to to decide what we do about that, whether we whether we return a signal or, or not. So my my own personal opinion is that um, uh, I, I think there would be no harm, no more harm in returning a signal because I just think that if they're if they're advanced enough to come and visit us and do harm, then they know about us already. That's my own opinion. <laughs> sure. Um, you talked about sending signals out. I know that we, we sent out like a gold disc or something, didn't we, with um, some mathematics oh, yeah, that's on right. it. Yes, yeah, so the, the Voyager probes uh, carried a, a gold um, sort of LP record. Where so, so this is back in the days when we used to use, well, I suppose uh, many, many people still do use vinyl, but uh, <laughs> this, this wasn't vinyl. It was a record, but not a vinyl. It was a gold plated uh, uh, LP and it contained um, a range of, of messages and sound recordings from you know, a cross section of, of different people, different occupations and, and so forth. And there was also a um, a sort of an engraved diagram which showed a picture of a, a, a man and a woman and some sort of schematic representation of, of uh, the position of Earth in, in the solar system. 
Um, so that was that was that was sent packing with the Voyager probes. The Voyager probes were were launched in the late 1970s. They did um, they did a tour of of Jupiter and Saturn, and Voyager two went on to visit Uranus and Neptune. Uh, they've both exited our, our solar system, or at least the the uh, the, the sort of uh, yeah the, the main part of our solar system. And uh, they're on very different trajectories now. We're, we're still, uh, I think, able to get weak signals back from them. They're, they're powered by a sort of small nuclear uh, power source, so they're still functioning, uh, at least for the next sort of decade or so. And, um, yeah, they're on their way to, to whatever's out there. I, I don't think... I think it's going to be tens of thousands of years, though, before either pass that close to any particular star. They weren't; their, their trajectory wasn't oriented to visit any particular star. So, uh, I think the chances of that that record being being examined is is pretty slim. But I, I think it's a nice touch. I think it's a recognition of the fact that that um, you know. That there could be something else out there, and 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 why not why not carry a, a, a signal for them to to try and work out what we're all about? Yeah, and I guess like that, it comes back to how would we even communicate? I guess with other intelligent life, would it it would have to be I guess almost language independent in terms of like I, I doubt they will speak English or a, a human language. So, um, is there ways we know we can speak to other intelligence if we if we were to come across upon them? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Google Translate is good, but it's it's probably not that good, right? So, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, I think we have to kind of rescope what we even mean by communication, and this goes back to the distance uh, issue that I talked about. I mean, the the nearest star system is four light years away. So, what that what does that mean for communication? It means that we've got an eight year you know turnaround for for messaging, even if there is an intelligent civilization. On the very nearest star system, um, so kind of you know we're not going to be having a, a, a sort of a big conversation with these people in, in, or people beings. Uh, in a sense, it's uh, it's more like a message in a bottle, isn't it? When you, it's more like a sort of one way messaging. I think it's more sending a, a signal to say you're not alone. We're here too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and listening out for similar messages from from other potentially from other systems, and it may well be. I mean, I've I've done a bit of work on on the idea of what might be on, on targeted SETI. So uh, on, there's two ways of searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. One way, um, which I've already talked about, is just surveying as many stars as possible in the hope of finding a signal from one of them. So that's like survey SETI. But you could try and use the knowledge we have of, of say, exoplanet systems and potentially target the ones that are might be most promising for the possibility of life and, and target those, you know, monitor them more regularly, say, or monitor them over a broader range of, of wavelengths or, or perhaps, um, you know, just monitor the data from them more carefully with smarter algorithms that might take a bit longer. So you can you can monitor them more thoroughly, but obviously you have to be smarter about how you choose them. So I've developed a strategy about how we would select such targets using using game theory, essentially. Um, and one of the outcomes of that uh, was that the, the the systems we might choose to listen to wouldn't necessarily be the systems that we would choose to transmit to if we wanted to send a transmission to say to them they're not alone too. Um, so it turns out that uh, if you just take this message in a bottle idea that it, it, you're never going to have a two-way conversation, it's all about just saying you're here, um, then some systems are good for listening to um, and some systems are better for transmitting to it. It all boils down to the idea that you target systems that are most likely to have evidence of us uh, being in a habitable planet. So there's a, a sort of two-way recognition that they know that we could be inhabitable, but they also know that we might know that they're inhabitable. And likewise, we're thinking that about them too. And, and you know, as I said, this idea came from, from, from game theory. Actually, um, it's, a, it's a class of, of, of games, uh, of cooperation games between 
two non-communicating participants. And um, so there's a famous example of uh, two people who are both offered a large sum of money if they manage to meet each other somewhere in New York City on a particular day, but they're not told when during that day, and they're not told where in New York City. They both just got to work out how to meet and at what time. And so they've both got this strong incentive to meet because they'll win the money, but they haven't got a clue when and where. So they will start thinking about what will the other person do? And in terms of where to meet, well, maybe they'll meet at a famous landmark, maybe the Empire State Building or within Grand Central Station or something like that. And in terms of time to meet, well, a good meeting time might be lunchtime, noon or something like that. So it turns out the decisions they'll make won't be entirely random. They'll be motivated to make certain kinds of decisions. They will be cooperating with each other, even though they're not communicating with each other. So these kinds of favoured decisions are known as, as shelling points after the, the Nobel Prize winning economist uh, Thomas Schelling, who, who uh, first talked about these ideas in, in, in detail. In fact, he, he worked for the US uh, for U.S. defense for, for during the Cold War on Cold War strategy, and he's, he's credited with ideas like mutually assured destruction. So it's kind of a bit unnerving to to sort of, uh, to, uh, to uh, use those kinds of principles, but in, in a way, the ideas there are pretty solid. And I think these 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 kind of games, the, the idea of people meeting up in New York, I think that there's been actual experiments to try and verify that, and they've shown some success that it, you know you really can have cooperative games between two non-communicating participants. So that's the situation we're in in SETI in searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. If there's intelligence out there that wants to be found, uh, they may well benefit from using game theory principles and we may well benefit from doing the same. And it then boils down to uh, looking at places that have a good possibility of being able to detect us and this mutual recognition that that's the case. And that, that leads to some fairly concrete um, recommendations for what planets you focus on. I think the, the example of New York there was fascinating. And you mentioned that obviously the two parties have an, an interest, uh, an, in, an incentive to find each other. What would you say is the, the main incentive for us to go looking for alien life? Why is it, why is it so important? I think ultimately we can't help ourselves. Uh, you know, we are we are curious creatures. The reason we are it, it defines us as as humans, right? Our curiosity is 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 an inextractable part of what it is to be human, and it's it's part of what it means to be intelligent. Um, and I think if there is intelligent life out there, but you know whether or whatever we we define by intelligence, I think we'll have to include a natural curiosity to explore and to try and understand the world or the universe around you. So and it, it, I think once you have that in a, in a, in a, a, a living being, I think it's a natural, it, it's just inevitable that you're going to want to know, well, is there anything else out there like me or, you know, recognizably like me? So I think we're sort of driven to it at some level. I think it's, it's, it's just a, a part of our condition. And the question is, is it a part of the condition of any other form of life out there? Mm. And, uh, you know, as I say, I think it would be, it would be remarkable to find that it wasn't just as much as it would be remarkable to find that it is. And so it's an endeavor which uh, I don't think we can, we can help ourselves from doing. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's about saying we're here and are you, are you there? You know, we, we want to know whether there's life out there. I think I've, I don't think I've ever met somebody who isn't interested in knowing whether there is life out there. And we've all got strong opinions about it. But we're now at this remarkable phase in, in scientific progress where we are, we are really able to try and tackle this question in a, in a, in a sensible and, and, um, and thorough way. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. But what's happening with the uh, search for um, intelligence? Um, what would you say to people who uh, believe aliens have already come to Earth, ancient aliens building the pyramids? <laughs> well, I, I mean, in science, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And, and that extraordinary evidence 
has to stand on its own. In other words, there's not a more boring explanation to explain the same thing. And with the, with the, with the specific example of the pyramids, as remarkable as they are as structures, uh, given, given their age, uh, we do have credible theories for how they could have been constructed uh, at, at the time. Okay, uh, so uh, so that rather more boring explanation take you know trumps any more remarkable explanation. That's how, that's how science works. You take the simplest explanation uh, of of the evidence. Um, so now it might well be the case that aliens did build it and put in, you know, just fool the rest of us into thinking that there's a far simpler explanation. But science can't progress if you if you just always jump on the most, you know, incredible explanation. You have to, you have to say, you know, if there's a simpler method, then we adopt that as the truth until we have any other evidence that points to the contrary. So unless there's, you know, until there's some evidence from the pyramids that might point specifically to extraterrestrial origin, we stick with a simple idea that it was just built with a, a lot of slaves under, you know, for, for the pharaohs of the day or whatever. So um, because, you know, they had the means and the personnel to do it. And we, we have credible explanations for how it could have been done. Now, more generally, whether life has, uh, whether intelligent life has, has ever landed, the same rule applies. We, we don't have any firm evidence. Now, now the Earth's surface is, is one which um, uh, it's harder to spot such evidence because it's not it's not pristine and untouched over billions of years. It does get resurfaced by volcanism, plate tectonics, etc. So who who knows what evidence might be buried deep? But until we find that evidence, we have to take the 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 sort of sober position of saying um, that that you know probably we haven't been because there's no evidence to say that we have. And that's not um, that's not to say it's impossible. But, but, you know, again, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And it's, it's quite remarkable, quite telling, perhaps, that um, in an era where all of us now own, pretty much all of us own mobile phones with incredible cameras, um, the, the, the sightings of UFOs haven't sort of exploded and, and shown to be, you know, there isn't yet that very clear, um, you know, YouTube video of a UFO flying past uh, uh, and, and, you know, little green men stepping out of it. So, you know, despite the fact that we, we all are equipped with cameras that can spot anything at any time and you see some pretty remarkable things on YouTube, but one thing we don't see is irrefutable evidence of, of unidentified flying objects, so that 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 perhaps in itself says that that, that uh, it yeah there's it's either in, so incredibly rare or it just hasn't happened. Probably the nearest miss, if you like, that we've got to date of a signal from a, a distant uh, system is is known as the the Wow signal. Uh, so this came up in a. A, a SETI search undertaken by Ohio State University in the in the 1970s, and from their data, there was one signal which was far stronger than anything else. It showed up as a as a an, a signal which uh, grew smoothly in intensity and then died down very smoothly uh, as a function of time. It lasted about 70 minutes or so, I believe, and. To date, we don't have any clear explanation for what the signal is. It was transmitted at a frequency which is regarded as quite a, 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 a special frequency. It's around 400, uh, 1,420 megahertz, 1 1.4 gigahertz. And this happens to be the frequency where we get emission from hydrogen gas. Okay, so, so hydrogen gas is the most abundant element in the universe. And it naturally emits at this specific frequency. But this particular signal uh, was very, very precisely geared near that frequency. In fact, the width of the signal in frequency space was only 10 kilohertz. So it's a very narrow signal in frequency space. And that's very unlike the kind of signals we see emitting from uh, neutral from hydrogen gas because hydrogen gas is moving all over the place. It's in clumps and whatever. So, so the signal tends to be smeared out over a much broader frequency range because of, of the motions of the gas. This signal was quite precise, um, and it was it was very clearly seen in the data. 
Um, but unfortunately, despite repeated efforts to, to locate the signal again, uh, there's never been a repetition of it. So it seen towards uh, the constellation of Sagittarius um, about a, a position which is about three, three and a half degrees from the, the plane of the Earth's orbit from the sun. So, um, so you know, it could have been emitted by a civilization that, that wasn't so far away from being able to see the Earth transit the sun. So there's, there's some kind of credible rationale behind it. But uh, it hasn't been followed up by any further signal, despite us looking very hard. And again, um, you know, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I think we would need to see such a signal being repeated or being seen in different telescopes to know for sure that it isn't some sort of contamination in the telescope. And, you know, the, the people who, who found the signal certainly worked very hard to try and exclude um, Earth-based contamination. And it's, it's actually quite difficult to explain, even to date, uh, in terms of any Earth-based contamination. So it's a, it's, a, it's a decent candidate signal, but it's not enough on its own for us to be to, to say, yeah, we think this is uh, uh, has to have originated from some sort of deliberate intelligent emission. That's all we have time for today. I'd first like to thank Eamon for his time and his expertise. You can find him on Twitter at Eamon underscore Karens. Why should there? Why not follow at UOM Sai Eng too? You can find us on Instagram and Facebook too. To find out more about our research, you can go to www.se.manchester.ac.uk. If you have any questions about this podcast or anything else, you can email us at fscmarketing at manchester.ac.uk. Next time we'll be a little closer to home, quite literally, as we speak to Claire Brown all about the future of sustainable homes. She'll hopefully be able to answer the question, what will the sustainable homes of the future look like? See you then!